The early minimalists had a surprising amount in common with the high modernists of the post-war era, even as they seemed to be rebelling against them. Certainly the minimalist music was more tonal, more pulse-based, but what it shared with the modernists was a sort of rationalist sense of music. The idea of the composer as scientist, music built from patterns or equations without much space for intuition or spur of the moment invention. And John Adams' early works fall into this vein. His early piano piece Phrygian Gates for example is structured very cleanly around a cycle of fifths chord pattern that modulates between two different modes throughout. So the entire structure of this piece was mapped out in advance. But Adams' 1985 work Harmony Lehrer brought something different. It was Adams' attempt to say that intuition in music wasn't dead. You could allow yourself freedoms while still retaining a sense of modernity. The piece at the time was seen as an uneasy hybrid between the minimalist sound worlds that open the piece and form a lot of the third movement with the late romantic sounds which clearly show the influence of Sibelius's fourth symphony and Mahler's unfinished tenth symphony and these dominate the central part of the first movement and the entire second movement. Adams himself said that this mixing was a conceit that could only be attempted once but as time has gone on, those distinctions seem to matter less, and taken as a whole, there's no doubt that this is a work with symphonic aspirations. The symphonic argument is particularly noticeable in the harmony, which pitches minor and major tonalities against one another, with the major triumphing in the end, as in so many 19th century symphonies, but also in the ways the entire piece offers a sense of alternation of ideas, a sense of departure and return, conflict and resolution. But let's look at those ideas, and we'll focus on the opening movement. To me, one of the most striking features of the piece is that within this framework of contrast, the ideas, the themes themselves, are quite deliberately unmemorable, at least at the phrase level. Of course, the opening gesture of the work is incredibly memorable, those thumping repeated notes. But how much of the specific detail beyond that do we retain? It's striking to think that in terms of thematic material, the opening five or six minutes of the piece is not much more than a series of overlapping one-note rhythms. So the opening gesture itself is memorable, but individual moments within it as it continues are quite unmemorable. And interestingly, the same is true of that more romantic middle section of the movement. It's a kind of melodic line that Adams has used throughout his career since Harmony Lehrer. He calls it sensucht, which roughly means longing or pining. There are a lot of repetitions within this kind of line, but there's also a lot of jagged angular leaps, and it all happens within a gradually shifting mode, but quite deliberately non-motivic, unmemorable at a phrase level. So even though these two styles in the piece are quite different, they share this crucial element in common, the way they stay in our memory as more of an overall idea than a specific line. And this, I think, is crucial to how Adams, in this piece and in many of the pieces since, has gone about synthesising the minimalist language with the structures and expectations of the musical past. By avoiding memorable themes, he avoids all the traditional and perhaps overused symphonic approaches of development, recapitulation and so on. So there's a kind of traditional multi-movement symphonic mould, but instead of thematic ideas, Adams pours in this new content. It's a strategy that could easily backfire, deliberately choosing to use unmemorable material. But somehow Adams pulls it off. His music is intense and emotionally open, but also enjoyably reckless and willing to throw out all the rules. And this brings us to that title, which has always been a bit ambiguous. It literally translates as the theory of harmony, but it refers, of course, to a treatise on tonal harmony by by Arnold Schoenberg, and given that Schoenberg is himself often seen as a high priest of modernism, the kind of figure that Adams has railed against his whole career, you could be forgiven for assuming that the title was a sarcastic dig, but if anything I'm drawn to the arguments Scott Strovas makes in his paper on the two different harmony lehrers, where he suggests that to conclude that Adams's work is a statement about tonality would be oversimplistic. Instead, Strovas argues, Adams recognised in Schoenberg's work an overall artistic approach, a kindred rebellious spirit, someone who won't listen to a rule just because it's well established. Both works take as their material an accepted framework for Adams, minimalism, for Schoenberg, tonality, with the intent of undermining that framework. And above all, Harmony Lehrer was a statement of intent for Adams, that he was ready to take on aesthetic challenges, whether they are challenges from his immediate contemporaries or from further in the past. In other pieces, he's sometimes done this with a twinkle in his eye and a strong hint of comic irony. But here, and for the first time, we see him tackle the big musical questions, 
and forge his own answers with complete sincerity.